Hello geographers, welcome to this presentation, a unit summary of sustaining ecosystems. The specification overview is as follows. You need to revise why are natural ecosystems important, understanding what ecosystems are, why tropical rainforests matter to us, looking at biodiversity and why they're being exploited. You also need to cover polar environments. So what's it like in Antarctica and the Arctic? And how are humans seeking a sustainable solution for polar environments? Remembering the case studies for this are in two separate videos on our YouTube channel. So why are natural ecosystems so important? We know that ecosystems are natural areas in which plants, animals, and other organisms are linked to each other and to the non-living elements of the environment to form a natural system. Each ecosystem is made up of both biotic and abiotic elements. So biotic elements comprise all the living parts of the ecosystem, including plants, animals, and bacteria. In the natural world, plants are known as flora and animals are known as fauna. Abiotic elements are the physical, the non-living parts of the ecosystem. These might include temperature, water and light. If we look at the nutrient cycle in ecosystems, this shows the stores and the flows that happen in ecosystems. Nutrients can be stored in the soil, in biomass and in litter. And the nutrients flow from one store to another in a cycle. So you can see here in this diagram how in the biomass, the living matter of those plants, dead leaves fall from the plants. They then become part of the litter. It decomposes into the soil, which is a mixture of weathered rock and organic matter. And then it's taken up again um, through the roots of those plants um, into the biomass. Food chains are also found in ecosystems, and we know that organisms within those ecosystems are classed as producers, consumers, or decomposers. A producer is an organism that uses sunlight energy to produce food. A consumer is, as it suggests, it's an organism that gets its energy by eating other organisms. It eats producers or other consumers. And you can see here a very basic food chain with producers at the bottom, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and then right at the top, tertiary consumers. A food chain shows what eats what. A food web shows lots of food chains and how they overlap. A decomposer is an organism that gets its energy by breaking down dead material, like dead producers, dead consumers, or fallen leaves. Bacteria and fungi are decomposers, and this returns nutrients to the soil where they can be used by plants. Here's an example of a food web. It looks much more complex than a food chain. You can follow that to see who eats who. Right at the top, you can see wolves, mountain lions, and cats. Obviously above that would be humans. Ecosystems can be classed as biomes. So large scale ecosystems that are spread across continents and have plants and animals that are unique to them. So these are our biomes of the world. And you can see that around the equator, we have tropical rainforests, where we live, we have temperate deciduous forests going into coniferous forests um, and tundra. So coral reefs are mostly found between 30 degrees north and south of the equator, a few miles off the coast. Temperate forests are found mostly in the mid latitudes between the tropics and the polar regions. There are two types of grassland, Tropical savanna grasslands are found between the tropics and temperate grasslands are found at mid latitudes. Tropical rainforests are found around the equator between the tropics. Hot deserts are found between 15 degrees north and 35 degrees south of the equator. So in between 15 degrees and 35 degrees north and south. 
and polar are found at the North and South Poles. Now, if we look at each of these in much more detail, we're going to look at the flora and fauna that are found there and the climate too. So in hot deserts, we know that there's very little rainfall due to that high pressure, less than 250 millimetres per year. Temperatures are extreme, very hot in the day, they can go up to 45 degrees centigrade and drop at night to zero. The plants that are found here is sparse due to the lack of rainfall. Plants that do grow are like cacti and thorn bushes. Plant roots are often very lo long to reach deep water supplies, or they spread out wide near the surface to catch as much water as possible when it rains. Some plants, like cacti, have fleshy stems and thick, waxy stems, waxy skin to cope with the dry climate. The animals that live here are home to like lizards, snakes, insects, scorpions, and the mammals tend to be small. Many birds leave during the hottest weather. The animals have adapted to cope with the harsh climate. Many animals are nocturnal, so they can stay in burrows or in the shade during the day. Some animals, bigger ones, have evolved to lose very little water and to tolerate dehydration, like camels. This is very different to the polar biomes. So the climate here, very cold, temperatures are usually less than 10 degrees centigrade. Winters are normally below minus 40 degrees and can reach almost minus 90. Rainfall and snowfall is low, no more than 500 millimetres a year. There are clearly divine seasons, cold summers and even colder winters. The plants that are found here are very few. There are some lichens and mosses, they're found on rocks, and there are a few grasses and flowering plants on the coast where it's warmer. They grow slowly and they don't grow very tall. Grasses are the most common plants. Closer to the poles though, only mosses and, mosses and lichens can survive. There are some small short trees and shrubs that grow in warmer shelter areas. The animals that live here are relatively few different species compared with other ecosystems. You've got polar bears in the north, penguins in the south, and marine mammals like whales, seals, and walruses are examples of animals found in polar regions. In the temperate biomes, the climate, the temperate forests, have got four distinct seasons, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Summers are warm and winters are cool. Rainfall is high, up to about 1,500 millimetres per year, and it rains all year round. The forests that receive the highest amount of rainfall are sometimes called temperate rainforests. The plants that are found here, there are lots of trees, but the type of tree depends on the type of forest. Deciduous forests have broad leaf trees that drop their leaves in autumn, like oak, shrubs and undergrowth. Forest floor plants like bluebells, they flower in the spring before the trees grow leaves and they block out the light. But coniferous forests common in Scotland have evergreen trees like pines and firs and an understory of grasses and low growing plants. Trees are evergreen so that they can make use of available sunlight all year round. The animals that are found here are like mammals, like foxes and squirrels, the birds like woodpeckers and cuckoos, and insects like beetles and moths. In tropical rainforests, the climate is the same all year round. There are no definite seasons. It's hot between 20 and 28 degrees C, and only varies a few degrees throughout the year. The sun is overhead near the equator all year round. It's very high with rainfall, 2000 millimeters a year. It rains every day, usually in the afternoon. The plants here, most trees are evergreen to take advantage of the continual growing season. The vegetation cover is dense, so very little light reaches the forest floor. There are lots of epiphytes, plants that grow on other living plants and take nutrients and moisture from the air, like orchids and ferns. We know that the rainforest has four distinct layers of plants with different adaptations. 
For example, trees in the highest layer, the emergence, are very tall. They've got big roots called buttress roots to support their trunks and only have branches at their crown. L plants lower down, though, in the under canopy have large leaves to absorb as much light as possible because it's very dark under those trees. The rainforests have more animal species than any other ecosystem. Gorillas, jaguars, anacondas, tree frogs and sloths are all examples of rainforest plants. There are also lots of species of insects and birds. Many animals are camouflage, like leaf-tailed geckos look like leaves so they can hide from predators. Other animals are nocturnal, like sloths. They sleep through the day and feed at night. It's cooler and it helps them to save energy. In grasslands, the climate in savanna grasslands, are quite low rainfall, 800 to 900 millimetres a year. Think giraffes and distinct wet and dry seasons. Temperatures are highest around 30 to 5 degrees centigrade just before the wet season and they're lowest about 15 degrees C just after it. But temperate grasslands have hot summers up to about 40 degrees centigrade and cold winters right down to about minus 40. They receive 250 to 500 millimetres precipitation each year and mostly that's in the late spring and early summer. In savannah grasslands, it consists mostly of grass, scrub and small plants with a few scattered trees like acacia trees. Plants are adapted to cope with low levels of rainfall. Many have long roots to reach deep water or small waxy leaves to reduce water loss. Temperate grasslands are also dominated by grass like, and small plants. They have very few trees. Grasses often have roots that spread out wide to absorb as much water as possible, remembering they get much less rainfall, only 250 to 500 millimetres. In the savannah, the animals that live here are lots of insects, grasshoppers, beetles and termites, and larger animals like lions, elephants, giraffes, zebra and antelopes, think Lion King. Temperate grasslands, though, are home to fewer animal species than savannas. Mammals include bison and wild horses and rodents like mole rats. In both types of grassland, grazing animals like antelope travel long distances in search of food and water, while other animals like mole rats dig burrows to escape the harsh climate. Our final one is coral reefs. And we know that obviously they're most common in warm areas that receive lots of sunlight and they grow in shallow, clear, salty water. Their plants are coral forming underwater, so few plants grow there. Tiny algae, plant-like organisms, live inside the tissue of the coral. The algae and the coral depend on each other for nutrients. The coral itself is an animal. It's a bit like a sea anemone, but some species create a hard outer coating for protection. Around 25% of all marine species live in coral reefs, including fish, mollusks, sea snakes, turtles, and shrimps. Many fish have flat bodies so they can easily swim through and hide in small gaps in the coral. Now you need to know two types of biome. We're gonna focus in on the tropical rainforest and um, the polar regions of Antarctica and the Arctic. And we know that the tropical rainforest is made up of four or five layers here. The ground layer containing less vegetation due to the dark, damp conditions. It's a thick layer of decomposing leaves and the buttress roots of trees. The shrub layer is dense and dark with small plants. It's still really dark on the shrub layer. The under canopy contains younger trees and saplings competing for light in those dark conditions. The main canopy is the roof of the forest and you can see it there. It contains tall trees, climbing plants like vines and lianas and 50% of the rainforest life is found in the canopy. But then just above the canopy, we have these emergent trees. They contain the tallest trees emerging out of the canopy. Now within the tropical rainforest, you must know about the water cycle. And you can see it here in diagrammatic form, but it, there's an explanation too. 
We know that water evaporates from water bodies and the land. And evaporation is when water is heated by the sun and turns into water vapor. Transpiration is the same as evaporation, but from plants. Water vapor is moved by the winds. The water vapor condenses to form clouds and then falls as rain, remembering this normally happens in the afternoon. Water flows from one place to another in various ways and is also stored on the land. Water eventually ends up back in the river or the sea and the cycle begins again. It's very similar to the nutrient cycle. It's a way that we know that nutrients move through the ecosystem. Trees are evergreen, so the dead leaves and other material fall all year round. The warm, moist climate means that fungi and bacteria decompose that dead organic matter really quickly, releasing nutrients into the soil. Rainwater soaks into the soil and the nutrients are dissolved in the water. Dense vegetation and rapid plant growth mean that the nutrient-rich water is rapidly taken up by plant roots. See if you can redraw that diagram from memory. Pause the video here and have a go. The soils that are found in the rainforest are very low in nutrients, as most of those nutrients are quickly taken up by trees or leach, they're washed downwards through the soil where the plants just can't reach them. At the top, there is a litter layer, very thin as the leaves decompose, they rot very quickly in the heat. The topsoil is fairly shallow. It's a mixture of decomposed organic matter, leaves and twigs and minerals. The subsoil is deep due to the weathering of the rocks below. The underlying rock weathers quickly at high temperatures to form subsoil. A key term for you to know here is weathering, the wearing away of material in one place. It's normally a chemical reaction in the rainforest between the soil and the rock, or the rock is broken apart biologically by roots. Now we all know that the rainforest is incredibly important to us, and that's because it's regulating so much of our life support systems. It regulates our atmosphere. All tropical rainforests like the Amazon help to offset the effects of climate change by taking in carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and releasing oxygen, thereby regulating levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They help to maintain soil health, in areas like the Amazon, tropical rainforests have produced rich, fertile topsoil due to the rapid leaf fall and decomposition, which rapidly recycles nutrients. They can be used to grow cassava and maize, which is a staple diet of the local people. They also influence the hydrological cycle. They help to provide water for people. Trees act as a water store by intercepting rainfall. They release water into the atmosphere by evapotranspiration. This then falls back down again as precipitation and so gives the people living in areas like the Amazon a constant supply of water. The tree roots also increase infiltration, allowing increased amounts of water to percolate to groundwater stores and develop aquifers. So there are lots of goods and services that the rainforest provides us. So one of those is food. So nuts, which form part of the diet of local people in the Amazon, and obviously Brazil nuts form part of our diet too. But they also give us cash crops, like the development of wild coffee that resists disease and has a higher yield than the Arabica beans traditionally used by growers in the rest of Brazil. They give us medicines. They've been used to search um, for many years for medicines. For example, there's a periwinkle, um, which helps treat childhood leukemia. And they give us raw materials. They can be logged to produce timber, like hardwoods for garden furniture. In Indonesia, oil palm plantations cover 14.6 million hectares and employ over 20 million people, making up 14% of Indonesia's exports, valued at around 28 billion US dollars, it's used in everything, cosmetics, confectionery, detergents, and lots of products. So what are the threats to the tropical rainforest? Obviously the biggest one is deforestation, and that happens for farming. 
So large areas are cleared for pastoral farming as the global demand for meat has increased, but also arable farming. The lots of cash crops such as soya beans often grown in monoculture plantations. Logging, tropical rainforests are cut down so that valuable trees like mahogany can be accessed and sold for timber to make furniture. Other trees are cut down for making paper products. We use it for mining. The Amazon basin is rich in natural resources like iron ore, copper, tin, aluminium, manganese and gold. This has led to the development of mines, which results in the clearance of tropical rainforests. The Carajais mine in Brazil is the world's largest iron ore mine. Roads, the construction of access roads for farmers, loggers and miners results in large parts of the tropical rainforest being destroyed. Then you've also got hydroelectric power. Amazon Basin has resulted in large areas of the forest being flooded to create reservoirs and dams. And population. Population growth has resulted in the loss of tropical rainforest as land is cleared for subsistence slash and burn farming or to build houses and infrastructure. There's also some tourism going on too. Moving away from rainforests and into the cooler polar environments of the Arctic and Antarctic. Antarctica is in the south, it's a continent surrounded by ocean, while the Arctic is in the north and is an ocean surrounded by continents. So there are some real differences in the characteristics of the Antarctic and the Arctic. The Antarctic is a continent covered by immense ice cap and surrounded by the Antarctic Ocean. It has mountains up to 3,794 metres high. The ice is 4.5 kilometres thick in places. It is very cold due to the lack of direct sunlight. It's colder than the Arctic. Temperatures average minus 28 in the summer and minus 60 in winter. It is dry in Antarctica, 50 to 200 millimetres of rainfall, so it is a desert. Almost no vegetation. Um, this is mainly lichens and moss. The sea, though, contains phytoplankton. There are no terrestrial mammals, but there are penguins, seals and whales. But all the animals rely on the sea for food to prov or, or provide a habitat for breeding. There are some human activities that go on in Antarctica. There are some scientific bases. You also get tourists there. People go on holiday. But obviously, there are some threats from climate change and the extraction of oil, gas and metal. The Arctic is different. The majority of the Arctic is made up of ocean, which has lots of drifting ice and icebergs. The sea extends further in winter. On land, there are mountainous regions, areas that are permanently covered with snow and ice and areas of treeless tundra. The ice reaches heights of two to three meters. It is cold, obviously, due to a direct uh, a lack of direct sunlight, but it is not as cold as Antarctica. Temperatures average naught degrees in the summer and minus 40 in winter. The flora, the vegetation that's found here, you've got low shrubs, sedges and grasses, mosses and liverworts. Animal-wise, you have polar bears, arctic fox, reindeer and wolves, seals, whales and birds. There is a human population, a permanent population, north of 60 degrees north is greater than 4 million people, with many indigenous people like the Inuits. There are mining activities that happen here, but there are some threats from climate change and from the extraction of oil and gas and other resources. There's also the threat of the claims of sovereignty, like who owns it? So there are lots of opportunities for development in these polar environments. One is tourism, and there's been a huge increase in the number of people visiting. Many tourists visit Antarctica to experience its beautiful wilderness. There's fishing and whaling. The polar oceans are increasingly attractive for commercial fishing. Massive amounts of krill are harvested from the waters around Antarctica. You also have indigenous people. Antarctica does not have a permanent population, um, but over 4 million people live north of latitude 60 degrees north. They live, tend to live, the indigenous people, a subsistence lifestyle and sustainably manage those natural resources. 
The scientific research, there's between four and 5,000 people from over 14 different nations in scientific bases on Antarctica in the summer. They study the weather patterns, geology, and past climatic changes. You've also got an opportunity for mineral extraction. There's reserves of high value minerals like gold, silver, iron ore, and copper can be found in polar environments. But also energy, there's lots of fossil fuel here. So there's oil being extracted by the USA from Alaska. It's caused lots of concerns because it melts the permafrost. And countries are looking to Antarctica as a possible location for new oil supplies. We have finally come to the end. And I want to draw your attention to your knowledge organizer, which you will find in your folder, GCSE, an essential guide to success. It summarizes all those key ideas on two A3 sheets. It can be found in that section, GCSE Essential Guide to Success on Teams or on the school network. Alongside it, you will find a checklist of your whole specification where you can red, amber, green, how well you are doing with your revision. There's also a key vocab list on sustaining ecosystems to learn the key terms, that really specific tier um, three vocabulary that you need for especially your case study questions. And obviously you can go back over, watch this video again on your YouTube channel, CVS Geography. Thank you for watching.